Moments after takeoff, the Mooney's engine went silent. At 10.35 a.m. on October 31, 2025, a 1964 Mooney M20E tail number, November 79338, lifted off from Boston Spa, New York. On board were Frederick Fred Baber, 58, the new owner from Florida, and Alexander Hoff, 39, a flight instructor from New Hampshire. Seconds later, the airplane lost power and crashed into a neighborhood just beyond the runway. Baber was killed. Hoff survived with serious injuries. The NTSB prelim report is just out. Let's take a look and see what's the takeaway from this. Frederick Baber had recently bought this Mooney M20E, a classic fast single-engine aircraft built in 1964. Like many new owners, he was proud and eager to bring his airplane home, but his insurance company required him to complete flight training time with an instructor before flying solo cross-country. That instructor was Alexander Hoff. The two men met for the first time the night before the flight. They reviewed the airplane's paperwork, discussed the route to Punta Gorda, Florida, and talked through the maintenance work that had recently been done. This particular Mooney had a troubled recent history. A month earlier, during a test flight, the engine had lost power. The pilot landed safely and inspection revealed fuel contamination algae and debris inside the tanks. A local mechanic repaired the fuel tank, flushed the lines, and signed it off as airworthy. So when Baber and Hoff met that morning, they likely believed they were flying a healthy aircraft. The repairs were complete. The fuel looked clean. It was a fresh start, a new partnership, a new airplane, and a long flight ahead. It's easy to imagine the optimism in that cockpit, two pilots sharing checklists, making small talk, focused, confident, and ready. It was a crisp autumn morning, 11 degrees Celsius visibility, 10 miles, and gusty winds out of the west at 19 knots gusting to 28. Conditions were VMC visual meteorological perfect for flying, but those gusts meant a bumpy climb. The pre-flight inspection was thorough. Both pilots sampled fuel multiple times from the tanks, checking for any trace of water or debris. Each sample looked clean and blue, the color of 100 low-lead avgas. They taxied out and lined up for departure. The Mooney's Lycoming engine accelerated smoothly to 2,500 RPM, producing full power. The airplane rotated, lifted off, and began climbing. But just seconds later, at about 200 feet above the ground, the power began to fade. The instructor later told investigators that the RPM dropped quickly from 2,500 down to 1,500, then 500, then silence. He immediately took control, trying to turn back toward the runway. But at that altitude, there was almost no margin. He saw a house ahead, leveled the wings to avoid it, and the airplane struck a tree just 20 feet above the ground. The impact sheared the wing and brought the Mooney down in a residential driveway only yards from several homes. In the span of less than a minute, a routine takeoff had turned into a total engine failure, a textbook low-altitude emergency where every second counts and almost no decision feels like the right one. The wreckage came to rest in a quiet subdivision near Boston Spa. The Mooney's engine had torn free from its mounts lying beside the burned fuselage. The wreckage heading was 232 degrees matching the short left turn away from the runway. Investigators found all the major components together meaning the airplane stayed intact until impact. There was no in-flight breakup. The propeller told its own story. It showed no twisting, no leading edge gouges, and no cordwise scratches the metal was almost smooth. That absence of deformation is a key clue. It means the engine was not producing power when it hit the ground. A post-impact fire destroyed much of the cockpit and the left wing, but the right wing lodged in a tree above the wreck still contained about six gallons of clean blue fuel. That fuel was tested and it appeared normal. There was no evidence of water or debris at that point. Neighbors reported hearing the airplane's engine sputter, then go silent before the crash. No smoke was seen in the air before impact reinforcing the idea that this was a sudden power loss, not an in-flight fire. Emergency crews arrived within minutes. Hoff was pulled from the wreckage alive, but badly hurt. Baber did not survive. It's a heartbreaking contrast two men who met only the day before thrown into a life-and-death situation with no time to react. Just a few dozen yards separated the crash site from nearby homes, 
a reminder of how thin the line can be between tragedy and miracle in general aviation. Once the wreckage was recovered, investigators began the detailed teardown, looking for any evidence that might explain the sudden loss of power. The first checks were mechanical. Flight control continuity was confirmed from the cockpit to the tail and wings, which means there was no evidence of a jammed or broken control linkage before impact. The aileron's rudder and stabilator were all connected and functioning when the airplane hit the trees. Next, they focused on the fuel system since this Mooney had a known history of fuel contamination. Investigators carefully traced the system from the fuel tanks through the selector valve to the engine's injectors. Air was passed through all the lines and it flowed freely. There were no signs of blockage or debris. The engine itself was then inspected. When the propeller was rotated by hand, the crankshaft turned smoothly through a full revolution. All four cylinders showed normal compression and valve action. Inside the cylinders, the combustion chambers looked clean, with no abnormal wear or deposits. That ruled out any kind of catastrophic internal failure. Attention then turned to the fuel flow divider part of the airplane's fuel injection system. This device sits on top of the engine and evenly distributes fuel to the cylinders. It was disassembled and investigators found no obstruction. The diaphragm inside had been destroyed by fire, which isn't unusual in a post-impact burn, but the key discovery came from the engine-driven fuel pump, the heart of the fuel delivery system. When tested, the pump failed to produce any suction or pressure. The internal diaphragms were brittle and heat-damaged, and the housing was filled with engine oil, likely from the post-crash fire. However, investigators noted that because of the thermal damage, they couldn't determine whether the pump had already failed before impact or if it stopped working due to the fire. Still, a pre-impact pump malfunction remains a strong possibility, especially considering that this particular pump is a single point of failure in many fuel-injected lycoming engines. Finally, the magnetos, which provide spark to the spark plugs, were examined. Both showed severe fire damage. The right magneto's drive gear could turn, but no spark was produced. The left magneto was seized. Again, it's impossible to tell whether this was a cause or a consequence of the fire. In simple terms, investigators found no blocked fuel lines, no internal engine failure, and no mechanical breakage. But they did find that the components responsible for pumping fuel and producing spark were damaged beyond functional testing. That narrows the picture to a likely interruption of either fuel flow or ignition, both of which can cause an abrupt loss of power, just like the one reported by the instructor. At this stage, the investigation remains open. The final report will come months later after lab testing of recovered parts and maintenance records. But even from these early findings, we can start to piece together the broader lessons. This accident highlights one of the most unforgiving scenarios in aviation and engine failure during the initial climb. Frederick Baber was a newly minted Mooney owner just beginning to learn the airplane's personality. His instructor Alexander Hoff was meeting both the pilot and the machine for the first time. That's not unusual in ferry or insurance training flights, but it does mean both men were still developing a shared rhythm, what we call cockpit coordination. At 200 feet above the ground, the instructor had maybe 8 to 10 seconds to assess the problem and act. In that window, the mind races. Is it mixture fuel selector pump magneto, but altitude is disappearing with every second? He did what many instructors would instinctively do, tried to turn back toward the runway. It's a natural reaction, the runway is right there, visible so close. But as many accidents have proven, that maneuver known as the impossible turn can be deadly if attempted too low. Here's why. Turning increases the airplane's bank angle, which increases its stall speed and its rate of descent. At low altitude, that leaves no margin to recover if the wing stalls. In this case, the NTSB report confirms the instructor began a right turn, then realized he was too low leveled briefly, and made a slight left turn to avoid a house before impact. That sequence is exactly what we see in countless loss of power events, an immediate reaction followed by quick corrections as the pilot searches for the least catastrophic path. Add to that the wind gusts that morning up to 28 knots, and the challenge becomes even greater. A sudden gust can change airspeed by 10 to 15 knots in an instant reducing lift just when it's needed most. This isn't about error or blame. It's about physics and timing. Once the engine quit, the outcome depended on altitude attitude and luck factors that change second by second. The real takeaway here is how little time even experienced pilots have when the engine stops producing power after takeoff. 
Reaction time training and situational awareness all matter, but sometimes there simply isn't enough height to make any option survivable. At this early stage, there's no single mechanical culprit. What we see instead is a chain of small vulnerabilities, a history of contaminated fuel, a complex repair, a possible pump issue, and an aircraft flown for the first time by both its owner and its instructor. Each of those factors on its own might have been harmless. Together, they left almost no margin for error. There are a few clear lessons already emerging. First, after any fuel contamination event, it's crucial to verify not only that the tanks are clean, but that the entire fuel system lines, pumps, and injectors have been fully tested under power. Small particles or degraded seals can linger unseen. Second, when operating close to the ground, a straight-ahead landing is almost always safer than trying to turn back unless there's ample altitude. Even a controlled landing in rough terrain often provides a better chance of survival than a stall-spin accident during a steep turn. And third, as pilots, we're often eager to trust that a repaired airplane is ready. But a repaired system isn't always a reliable one. Extra ground runs high power checks or a local pattern flight before a long ferry can make all the difference. Frederick Baber's love for aviation led him to pursue his dream of owning and flying his own airplane. That passion is something every pilot understands. His instructor's survival and testimony will help investigators and hopefully other pilots learn from this tragedy. It's a sobering reminder that even when everything looks routine, the margin for safety can vanish in seconds. Sometimes the quietest seconds in the cockpit teach the loudest lessons. That's all for today's video. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll keep you updated when the final report is out. Fly safe, everyone.